Welcome everybody to the main act of this conference as every time when the Java conferences finally converge to the SQL talk, everyone is listening because that's something you can use every day and you will love it. How modern SQL databases come up with algorithms that you would have never dreamed of. And I'm going to keep this on a high level because SQL is a very uh, sophisticated language. You can go very, very deep into it. But during the couple of last years, last couple of years, when I was talking about SQL, mostly in the context of the Juke product that we're selling, I noticed that a lot of Java developers don't know how SQL works. Not just the syntax and the overall kind of feeling of relational algebra, but what happens behind the scene? And this talk is going to be about that. And it is, if this title is too long for you, this title will do it as well. You will walk out of this room and think, I want to do everything with SQL because you are here because you think this cannot be true, right? SQL 2017, this must not be true. And by the end of the talk, is it true though? And you're leaving this room, oh my God, I'm going to rewrite all my code to SQL. Myself, I'm Lucas. I'm involved with uh, Java and SQL and the Swiss community. Uh, some of you may have seen me before. I personally believe that SQL is a device whose mystery is only exceeded by its power. And before I go on with SQL, I have to instruct you what you have to do when you leave this room. I need you to concentrate and push right this button. This is the right button. You have to push this one, right? Don't forget. Okay. Why do I talk about SQL? Mostly at Java conferences. Few people think about this every day, but SQL is the only ever successful mainstream and general purpose fourth generation programming language. Now, there was this dream back in the days, and we heard in the, in the keynote this morning, Martin Thompson thought about, uh, talked about all these different programming paradigms, all these fundamentals, and one of these paradigms is a fourth generation programming language. This means it's a declarative language. We don't say to the machine, what to do, we just say what we want to have as a result. So we don't tell it how to do it, we just tell it what we want. And why doesn't anyone else talk about SQL at Java conferences? I just don't know. It's such an excellent technology. Who in here uses SQL? I don't see any hands, but I'm sure all the hands are up. And no one else talks about SQL except Flat. Where is Flat? I think Flat's over there. Perfect. You've heard his uh, transactions talk. Very, very interesting. So Flat is a developer advocate at Hibernate, and he has this blog. The most important blog on Flat's blog is the one where he shows how to use SQL with JPA, because that's the most important feature of SQL. And if you don't remember the URL, I've written down here, I've uh, URL shortened this uh, blog post so you can look it up. Very interesting uh, blog post, because there's this API, create native query. You should use it, right? So who has ever seen my other talk? I have this other talk, I see hands, I mean this one, I mean this one, right? The 10 SQL tricks to convince you that SQL is awesome. If you have never seen this talk, it is not that hard to find. Just Google 10 SQL tricks and you will be overwhelmed by choice of uh, various copies that I did at various conferences. You go watch that talk, to learn how SQL is awesome and there are 10 SQL tricks in that talk, for instance, this one. This is a very simple SQL statement. So the ones in the front row, they have already mentally calculated what is the result of this Postgres query, and you will see it is the Mandelbrot set. Now throw away all your, uh, all your user interface logic. You don't need Swing anymore. You don't need JavaFX anymore. Write it with SQL. You can directly calculate each pixel with a SQL statement. But today, we're not going to look into these kind of tricks. We're going to talk about more basic SQL, because we're looking more into performance aspect. And more basic SQL is still awesome, and you will see this. Is this SQL, my ladies and gentlemen? Do you think this here is SQL? Who thinks this is SQL? Yes? Okay, then this talk is perfect for you. This is going to be the level of basicness. I've already talked to you in the other talk about how SQL is awesome. We've seen that, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Today, we're focusing on the other two aspects. SQL is helping you be productive. And SQL is fast. How can you be productive with SQL? Now, there are two ways for me to prove this to you. There's one way, by example, and I show how awesome SQL is and wonderful techniques, and then there is a way to prove this by alternative, by showing, well, if you did it in Java instead of SQL, what would it look like? And I think both approaches are really interesting, and this is, as I told you, this is going to be a high-level talk. 
a conceptual story about SQL. We're not going into the deeper levels. Maybe some next year I will uh, go into the deeper levels, but I'm going to keep it high level this time. We have this model here. This is an entity relationship diagram. It's a DVD rental store. Don't bother about all the details. The interesting thing here is today is the film table and maybe the payment table. Now we have business, right? Business is always asking us things. We're the programmers. We want to just drink some coffee and chat and hang out and laugh at stupid memes. And then these business people come and they send us these kind of things, right? So business sends us a request. How much money did we earn with each film on each day? That's a typical question that business wants to have an answer for, and we have to program this. And we're thinking, all right, that's interesting. Let's see. So we have this model. They wanted to see how much money per film, right? So we probably take the film table, and the money is over there. So that's the payment table. So we somehow need the money table, uh, the money attribute from the payment table and the film table and luckily the day is also in the payment table so now we have all the information in these two tables what do we do we just try to find out how to get from a to b this is the path and this is called a join right so you see we have to join the film table inventory table rental table payment table and we're done okay let's go do it great so this is the sql statement you all agree this is already i have done my task it's this easy. First, I go to the film table because I want to calculate the money per film, right? So I have to uh, load the film table. And then this is the relationship between film and money. We just type all these joins, all these joins, typing a little bit. And then we group by the film and the payment date to calculate the sum of amounts. So this means per film and per payment date, I made this much money. That was pretty easy. Who agrees this was easy? Yes. Everyone agrees this is easy. Let's look at classic Java. We're Java developers. We like typing stuff with this verbose language, right? Sometimes it feels a little bit like this. Everyone feels like this. Let's look at how we could solve this problem with Java. First off, we start with a class. We need to write this class, right? So everyone's still with me? OK, good. Now, film is a tuple. So we're adding these attributes the tuple. Like in the database, we had a film ID and we had a title. And because this is Java, this is not enough. We have to add these guys as well, right? Nothing would be perfect in Java if we didn't fulfill the Java Beans convention that is a very gift uh, to our humanity. And we add these getters and setters because that might change in the future. We might implement get film differently, right? And then because it's Java, we add these guys as well. Right, so we have to do this because we want to compare films, so we need hash code and equals. And who in here, frankly, who in here remembers the last time you didn't implement hash code and equals the same way as Eclipse or IntelliJ would have generated the code for it? Right, so equals is just compare the first attribute with the first attribute and the second one. You're just doing this recursively, and we're topping this stuff all the time, and we have so much distraction. And because we have so much distraction, we need abstraction, right? Because Java, we're going to write these guys. We must not allow developers to instantiate new films. This is why we have to have a control mechanism on how you construct new films, and we're writing a new film factory. And because it's so dangerous, you not, must not allow developers to instantiate a film factory, we also have a film factory builder, right? So you can actually get the film factory from the film factory builder and everything is safe and we have the management of the life cycle of all these objects and there's still a mistake in this because it's much better to have interfaces than classes for these things. But when you have an interface, you also need an implementation. And there you go with the implementation. Everything has an implementation. And now only one instance, the global instance of our applications will know these implementations and that is Spring. Right, so we add those bean annotations. I have no clue if this is correct, but probably it is, more or less. We have these bean annotations, and now Spring can instantiate and manage the life cycle of these builder factories or factory builders, which provide us with factories, which provide us with the film. And then we add some Lombok, because everything we type is so tedious, so we need some more annotations to reduce the typing. And then, uh, while we're at it, some junior developer found a new library, so they're adding more annotations there. And that's the next iteration. And by now, the guys up there in space, in ISS, they can see our code from space, right? So that's right, your code, your average Java enterprise bean sitting right there in Zurich, visible from space. Now, 
I'm getting distracted. I wanted to talk about SQL, right? I wanted to talk about SQL, and I'm showing you SQL awesomeness by example, by comparison. There's more comparisons on this website there. Go visit it. It's very funny. And we've had a talk about this topic today uh, in the morning, uh, which was very interesting as well. And we haven't even solved the problem yet, because we only have the film. Now, from the film, we need to go to the inventory store rental payment. You remember? Now, this is Java or SQL. It's the same thing. There's actually no such thing as the object relational impedance mismatch. If you Google this, I will have an opinion on my blog as well on this topic, because in the end, you're modeling the same thing as in the database. You're modeling it again in Java, so you're probably writing something like this. From the film, you can get to a list of inventories. So we have a one-to-one -one model, one-to-one -one mapping. You could also map stuff not one-to-one, -one, but then you'll get into trouble later on. But we'll map this one-to-one, -one and we're using a mapping library like this one. Right, so everyone has seen these annotations here. So we have a one-to-many relationship, and uh, I think you work with these. And now, what, what happens if I do it like this? Is it going to be eager or lazy? Which is better? Let's ask Vlad. Lazy is better. Excellent. Thank you, Flood. Lazy is the better option here because Eager is a code smell. You can read it on his blog. Very interesting topic. And uh, we're not done yet. We have only declared what we already had with DDL, right? With DDL, we had a create table film and we had all the foreign key relationships because what we really want is this. We want the result. Business is still asking. They're sitting there. Where's my result? And now, okay, this is the Java way of doing it because we want to have the number, uh, the, the amount of money that we made per film and date. And one way to solve this would be a map of film, and each film has a map of date and de big decimal, because big decimal is the best uh, type for money uh, in the old days, because you want to have the precision. So this is the money, this is the film, and this is the date. And some of you might think, okay, let's just do JSR354. We have a now a Java Money API, so it's more um, semantic than just a big decimal. It tells you what it is. It's a monetary amount. And now we go check out the Java doc there, and we see we feel at ease with this API, right? So we have monetary, monetary amount, monetary amount factory, et cetera, et cetera. And we feel, oh my god. Okay. But we're not there yet. So this was the optimal result type. I'm going to just leave away the Money API for simplicity for now. Is this better than this? See the difference? Do I want to retain the iteration order while I fill these hash maps, or do I want to throw that away? I mean, there's a trade-off. This will be faster. This might be more correct in the sense of what I want to achieve. So this is a little bit different, but this would be even better maybe, right? So we can discuss these alternative map types. We can discuss these through lengths. And maybe we have that one junior developer who said, I know how these things work. I'm going to write my own map. Because what really sucks here is the doubly nested map. We want to have a single map, a multi-key map, which supports two keys and one value. And we're implementing this. And maybe there's even a library for this. And we're still discussing collection types. We have not answered business question yet. Who has felt like this before? <laughs> yes, the result is clear. The result is yes, everyone. We're always discussing these data types. And don't get me wrong. It's important sometimes to optimize these things. But sometimes we need to just implement business logic, and that's not interesting to the business. They don't care about your opinion on linked hash map. But let's assume this is the right type. And now we're loading all the films. So you see the snarky remark there on the method name. You get the idea. This is probably very slow. Why is it slow? Who knows? Uh, we'll just fix this later. And then the next developer comes and will fix this later, right? And then the next one says, oh, this is really urgent. This blows up in production. We don't know why films load so fast, slow. But let's ignore this for a moment. Let's iterate the films. And then we get the map out of the result per film. And you recognize immediately this is the same type. So when we have one film, then we go and fetch that map where we have the date to the amount mapping. And what now? Yeah, we have to avoid null pointer exceptions all the time. Yeah, right? You enjoy writing this code? OK. Because if this is the first time that we encounter the film, the hash map is null, so we have to fetch it, and then we initialize it. And there's a meme for this. This is the meme. And then we're just going to discuss this all over again. right? And I'm going to collapse this. This is the boring part. Now it's the interesting part. We're going to iterate. We're looping through all of these things. Now, we remember, Flat told us lazy is better. Is lazy better now? How many queries will this produce? n plus 1, m 
times, and so many queries. So every time we iterate, we get new queries. So maybe eager was better, but probably it isn't. It's very hard. So maybe if you Google on a JPA uh, blog, you will find a solution. The solution is an entity graph. There's this named entity graph thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's like a SQL query. It's just not SQL. So you say, I have this graph from the film, Inventors, Rentals, Payment Table. You have all these annotations. I'm feeling like this, if you see it, but maybe you prefer this kind of way. And remember this slide from before? So this was the enterprise bean before you added the entity graph. Now you add the entity graph, and now they can see your entity bean from Andromeda Galaxy. <laughs> That's where it is, right there. Okay? Now we've done the looping, and now the calculation of the amount. Yes, are we done? Can we just put the amount with the date? That's completely wrong, right? That's not the sum of amounts, that's just the last amount in iteration order. We have to put the sum of amounts in there. So that's how we enjoy doing things. We have local variables, and then if the map already contains the key, then we actually do the addition, and otherwise we do the initialization. And luckily Java 8 solves this, at least this uh, got better. We have now these compute methods, so we can do it in one go. It looks a little bit more clean, so we use this. But do you feel good about yourself? Let me ask you this. You're typing this enterprise business logic all the time. And don't get me wrong, sometimes you need to optimize these things. But most of the times you don't. This may be a report that runs once a year, but it's important that it gets done tonight. And you're still discussing data structures. And meanwhile, what always happens in these situations? Business is back, right? Ha! Did I say how much money per film? I meant per film and store. He was wrong, right? When does that ever happen? Changing requirements. Okay, there are two kinds of reactions, two kinds of programmer reactions. There's the SQL developer programmer reaction, and then there's the Java developer programmer reaction to this change of requirements. Here's the SQL developer. I got you covered, buddy. And here's the Java developer. <laughs> you spent all this time discussing hash maps, and it's completely wrong. You have to rewrite the algorithm, okay? So the SQL developer does this little thing. This was the SQL query. So some white space here, right? You see, immediately I'm reserving some white space and I'm putting these store IDs. And now I have the money I made per film and store on each given day. Easy. We can go drink beers now. Meanwhile, the Java developer, he does the same thing. He reserves some white space, just a little bit more code. And it's wonderful. You can immediately see that this calculates the money we made for each film and each day on each store. And what happens next, right? You see there's a map of map of map. There's this architect guy. Every team has an architect. And the architect says, that's by the way, that's this guy. He sees everything you do. <laughs> Every commit, he knows better and he has an opinion. And he tells you, we cannot have such types. Factor this out in a new class and then you need a factory, of course, for this new type. And you're like, oh. You want to already discuss because you're, you're a functional programmer and you like structural typing. You like maps of maps of maps. You don't need to give everything a name, right? You don't need to name everything. And while you're still discussing these philosophies, meanwhile, yeah, you know what's coming up next? <laughs> still wrong. Did I say daily revenue? I meant cumulative daily revenue. That's something entirely else. You don't even know what is, what is a cumulative sum. And you go to the internet, right? You choose your favorite browser and start typing cumulative sum. What does it mean? Yes? And now you find a result and you go, oh my god, it's Friday. Oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. Meanwhile, SQL developer, just some white space because just a little bit more code. Then go to Stack Overflow, copy paste this nice little function here. It's called a window function and we're done. This is the cumulative sum you see here. Film, store ID, date, sum, cumulative sum. Very easy to calculate. You see the cumulative sum is the sum of all sums up until that date. Wonderful. So you get the message, I think. <laughs> SQL is a fourth generation programming language. In SQL, we only declare the result. The database will figure out the algorithms for us. We don't care about the algorithms in most of these cases. Now, often we do and we check out what the database really does, we optimize these things, but very often the database gets it right, at least good enough. If we don't really have any requirements like high frequency trading where everything has to be super fast, usually it's good enough what the database figures out and mostly it's much better than what you would do. Algorithms are boring. I'm sorry, Martin, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> no, they're not boring, they're very interesting, but when you have to do so many business logic tasks, you can't, you just can't think about hash maps all the time, or lists, or trees. You have to get there, and SQL is a language that helps you do this. What we don't care about, usually, when we write business logic, is algorithms. We don't care about premature optimization, because that SQL query, it will run fast, probably. And if it doesn't, we add an index, right? So it will probably run fast. And we don't care about these data type details. Do we really already at the beginning care about if it's a hash map or a list of entries? These are two entirely different beasts. They have different characteristics, memory consumption, algorithmic complexity when you iterate them, complexity when you add something to them. But it shouldn't be that important at the beginning because business will change everything anyway. We don't care about local variables. When was the last time you enjoyed writing local variables, kind of like final int, and then you store something and then you need it back again later on? You don't, you don't enjoy that. You don't enjoy caching stuff because that's when it gets really hard because you think, okay, I'm going to cache this one doubly nested hash map because I don't want to calculate that all the time. Well, your cache invalidation problems will be bigger than your performance problems, and we don't enjoy writing loops. We don't enjoy this. We have to nest a loop and nest another loop and nest, and we don't enjoy initialization or null pointer exceptions. And then we can have a discussion about optional if you insist, but then you still have the initialization problem. You still have to initialize the thing, even if it's optional. What we do care about is business logic and, okay, a little bit of indexing, because eventually it has to be faster, but that's it. Now, some people claim I really like this tweet from Mario Fusco, he's also here at the conference. I showed you an ex imperative example. There's also a declarative-ish example with Java 8 now, finally we can use streams. And streams are really nice. I'm, I'm not even going to decipher what the imperative example on top does, because the streams example is so much easier to read. You can see here, this is like the from clause. So when you load all the lines from a file, that's like a table, right? So you iterate over this table, which is the lines of the file, and then there's your WHERE clause, we only want to have those lines of your file that start with ERROR, that's like the SQL-like predicate. And then we have something like FETCH NEXT in SQL or LIMIT, we only want the first 40 rows, and finally want to have that as a list. So, from a de um, development perspective, this is much better. It reminds us of this technology that is actually the best, right? So a stream of tuples is the same thing as a table. And any Java class is a tuple. If you think about it this way, a class has attributes. It's like a tuple with attributes. And a stream of tuples is a table. And the select operation in the select statement, it's like map on stream. We get a tuple as input and we get a tuple as output. And distinct is obviously the same thing. Join and flat map are pretty much the same thing as well. So when you have flat map, then you have a stream. And for each item in the stream, you have another stream. And then you combine these two, like with join, where having is filter, that's obvious. Group by, collect is simil similar, that's just names, right? Now when we have this Java algorithm and we compare it with this one, this will get much better <coughs> in Java. So we load all the films, this will be a stream of film, stream of inventory, when we flat map it to the inventories, stream of rentals, stream of uh, payments, still n plus one problem here because we still lazy load everything, but it is more readable. And now we have to access F and I in the collector because we want the film and the inventory to group by, right? So we can do this in Java by having entries. So we have to actually remember what we flat mapped before we flat mapped it. So we can use hash map entries, for instance, with the Java JDK libraries and we pray for uh, stack allocation to happen, which is probably not going to happen, but we have a lot of pressure on the garbage collection. So this is going to be quite hard to get performant, but we can get, get there, so we just add these couple of collectors, collectors here to get the same group by experience, and then we see this, right? So what the hell is this? So we, en we, we nested all these entries in entries and that, but it looks declarative, and if you're using better streams, so a little bit of advertising, our product Julamda is open source, so you can use it, or we had a talk about Java Slang, which also does similar things. Uh, we had it in the morning, I think. So there are some improvements just in the API perspective, so it does the same thing as the stream, but it has a better, uh, more convenient API, so for instance, we can have several aggregations in one go. This would change, so instead of the stream, we would have here a sequence in the Julamda library. Instead of these flap map operations, we would use something like cross-apply, like we know from SQL, if you know it. Um, so we here we have a nested tuple, film inventory, and then we nest this tuple once more. The film inventory tuple goes into a tuple, film inventory rental, payment. So this is how we work with Java, right? So we have all these generics. We always have to remember the types. So here we have 
this triply nested tuple, doubly nested tuple, singly nested tuple, and finally the film, and we group by film, right? We can optimize this more. We never actually needed the, the rentals. The rentals table was not useful, so we just skip it. We flap map this again, so we only have the payments table. This gets a little bit better. And finally, if you group by everything in one go, maybe even better now, this would be with Julamda, almost like streams. We have a kind of more convenient result set type. But the point here is, how much time did I spend on this problem now? I wanted to talk about SQL. And you're all here, when will this ever stop, right? This was the SQL query. It is so easy with SQL, so easy. And it is so hard with Java, because we have to think about all these things. These languages, these general purpose languages, they force us to think about these things. And sometimes that's a good thing. But sometimes that's not the best thing. And SQL solves these problems. It has always solved these problems. And modern optimizers, we'll get to that afterwards, solve it extremely fast. So this means it's a great improvement for developer productivity. <coughs> and I wanted to make this representative, right? So how much time did I spend speaking about SQL and speaking about Java? That's representative of how much time you spend on these technologies when you solve simple requirements like I did, right? So SQL is productive, I've shown this, and now the interesting chapter which we all came here for, well, it means SQL is fast, you are fast writing SQL, but SQL is also executed in a fast way. So this is the best chapter, SQL performance. How does SQL work? Now. Let's think about SQL the language. Here's again business. Business asks how many films did each actor whose last name starts with a play in? Now this is always very cryptic. I'm showing with uh, an example as uh, this is already the result. So we want to have this result. You see all the actors start with the letter A and that's how many films they played in. That's what business wants to have as a result. This would be the query. Now a query in SQL in the language is a string we send a string to the database. And a string is a very convenient data structure for these kind of things because it's a constant. And the database can easily generate a hash code for the string and then do some caching for the string. So there's a lot of work that the database does only once. So when you send this string for the first time to the database, it will calculate an execution plan and then cache that plan for the next execution. So all the work of figuring out the algorithm is done only once, ideally. Now, when we look at this statement, the first thing that happens logically... Now, SQL has a very weird syntax. Just ignore the syntax for today and look what happens logically. So the first logical operation is loading the tables. And by loading the tables, I mean all of them, including the joins. Now, observe again, this is logical, not actual. The database may choose to do something else first, but logically, the table operation, the from operation, is the first one. Then we apply the predicates. So we loaded all the films into film actors. Then we reduced the films again, uh, the actors, to have only those whose last name starts with the letter A. And then the third operation in this query is collecting the groups. So we create something like a hash map for the first and last name. And then we aggregate. We can do this in one step, but logically it's two steps. So once we have all the groups, we collect all the values in the group, in each group, and calculate this count value. Once we have the count value, we project, or this is also the select clause, and finally the order by clause. So you see the syntax is not exactly the same order that is actually logically happening. This is somewhat confusing to new people who are new to SQL. This is the complete logical operations order. <coughs> so the first thing is from, then where, then we have some uh, Oracle specific, because I'm an Oracle guy, I left them in here. Then group by and aggregations then having window functions, and then let's ignore model, and then select distinct union order by. This is the order of operations, and you have to understand this. There's also, if you Google this term, logical operations order, SQL operations order, you'll find documentation, for instance, on SQL Server, they also did it this way. This explains a lot of things, because, for instance, the aggregation step is here, right? So when you aggregate, when you do an aggregate function, that's step number five. This explains why you cannot access the result of an aggregate function in the WHERE clause, because the WHERE clause is already logically executed. It must happen before the aggregation. So you can never see uh, an aggregation function in the WHERE clause. You don't see that in syntax, it doesn't make sense, but if you think about SQL this way, or if you've ever used window functions, that happens now, after having. So window functions are defined here. This also explains why you can't use window functions in the WHERE clause. You can only use window functions in the SELECT clause and in the ORDER BY clause because they happen after this window step. Or the SELECT clause, it's here. Now when you do a column alias, 
you rename a column, right? So you have an expression and you give it a name. So instead of count star, you write C. You call it C. Now the select clause defines column aliases, and this means that the column aliases are only available normally if the database is correct. MySQL gets this wrong. They allow you to do funky stuff, but normally you can only access this column alias in the order by clause. That's the only clause because it's the only clause after the select clause which has column access. So that explains a thing or two. Maybe, maybe if this was confusing. But the logical operations order is not what's really happening. Any algorithm that produces the same result as would be produced by this logical operations order is acceptable. And that is how SQL works. Because we only care about our business logic. We care about this logic language. We care about our predicates. We care about business told us we only want to have last names starting with letter A. That's what we care about in our everyday work. We write thousands of these SQL queries a day. And we don't care about the algorithms. Why? Because on our developer machines, maybe we have 10 actors, but in production we have millions. So the algorithm that we think of is probably wrong because in production we have something else and maybe we have five customers and they all have different data sets. So on each customer, our algorithm that is linear would be wrong. We need something logarithmic for this huge customer, right? So these kind of things, we don't want to think about this all the time. We want to keep our minds on the business logic. This is already complex enough. I mean, who thinks that this was a complex query, right? No one thinks. You've seen worse queries than these. Monsters, I've seen 4,000 lines, and they still perform because no one cares about these hash map things, iteration things, everything. We just declare those 4,000 lines. Can we see the actual algorithm? Yes, we can. This will be the algorithm if we're using Oracle. So this is a display from um, Oracle SQL developer who has seen an execution plan before. Yes? No? Most of you... Oh, uh, I actually miscalculated this slide. It's about half-half. For everyone else, please do check them out. That is where all the answers are. If ever your query is not fast, then the answer is in the execution plan. All the tools have buttons. So in the SQL Developer for Oracle, you can click on this Explain Plan button, and it will display an estimated plan. It's important. It's the estimated plan. It's not the plan that will get executed, but it's what the database thinks will get executed if it is executed. Postgres, pgm 3 Explain Query, there's a button for this. MySQL and SQL Workbench, there's a button for this. All of them have that. SQL Server already gives you the option of having the estimated plan and the actual plan, and you can compare these things. That's the best tooling, in my opinion. But what is the actual algorithm? Let's look at the Oracle version, because I like it best because it is nicely structured as a table. Other databases have graphs that's uh, a bit harder to put in uh, slides. So there are two important columns here. The one is the cardinality um, estimate. And it says here, as you can see, I am using uh, the laser pointer in PowerPoint, the database estimates that our predicate here, last name starting with letter A, will produce six actors. So that's the estimate. The database thinks this will produce six actors. And then, at some point, we get 13 rows, according to the database. If you remember, we actually got six rows, or seven, if I remember correctly. But this is not off by an order of magnitude. The database is off by factor two, and the algorithm is still correct for this little bit of error that the database has when it estimates these things. So the cardinality is an extremely important column for you to check out. That tells you why does the database think a logarithmic algorithm is the best, or a linear algorithm is the best, or whatever algorithm is the best. And this is the cost column. This is a bit weird in Oracle. Other databases put here something as they estimate the number of milliseconds. Oracle has uh, uh, a cost that is, um, corresponds to the time it takes for one disk block access, which is a very weird measurement, but uh, it's historic. You just take it as an indicator, the bigger the worse, right? So you see this is a relatively cheap query, and what really happens in the correct order is, first thing we're doing is we're accessing the index. Now, I don't know if you can see it, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. The first thing is we're accessing the index that is on the last name column. Because we had this index, last name starting with A, and that the database thought this is going to be the best thing because now I'm going to reduce my result set to six rows. Instead of the other option would be just to load all the actors and then continue doing the joins. But the database decided to actually go first with the predicate and then it loads the other columns from the table. That's the second step. 
So usually when you see an execution plan, you go from the bottom to the up. There are whole different kinds of rules how you can interpret these. They're not very um, authoritative. They're kind of indicative of what really happens. But with some intuition, you get this. So now we're accessing the actor table because only the last name column was in the index. So we have to go to the table as well after the index and look up the first name because the user requested that in the result. And then we load the entire foreign key relationship into memory. Now that's a bit, that's interesting. Would you have done this? Now we have six actors and you think we'll get six actors. So you just iterate six times and go load to count the number of films that each actor played in. You do this six times, right? But the database thought, I get 5,462 rows in total because this is a very small test database. So I don't even bother doing any algorithmic optimization. This is just about five disk blocks or four or whatever. I'm loading the entire index into memory. And then what I'm doing next is I'm doing this hash join operation. So a hash join operation means I implement the join with a hash map where I put all the results from both sides into it and whatever sticks around is the result. There's a nested loop join algorithm where you take one side and then you iterate over this side like we did in Java before. That's a nested loop uh, join operation. So we iterate on one side and load the other side for each element on the left side. There's also merge join. You can Google these things. The different join algorithms. And finally, we do uh, grouping and ordering. So would you have chosen the same algorithm? Would this be the algorithm you have chosen? Well, maybe you would have thought of this. Probably you do, wouldn't. Maybe the most intuitive one is just seeking six counts individually. Now, the hash join operation has a complexity of O of n. n is the bigger table, in this case, film actors. Right? <coughs> the nested loop join with indexes is two times logarithmic, depending on both uh, table sizes. So which one of these is better? It depends. It just depends. Because Big O notation helps us make the right decision for large data sets. So here, I like Microsoft Excel for plotting these things. Very easy, right? We have all these different complexities. And as n grows, a linear complexity is much worse than a logarithmic one. We can see that. But sometimes you're here in this area, right? So this is a test database. But maybe you have some sample data. Maybe you have some production data. Maybe some table in your production system only has 100 rows. So you're also in this area where the generally faster algorithm is actually slower because it has some overhead. right? So when we access the index, we have overhead. We have to access the index disk blocks, and then we have to access the table disk blocks. If the table is small, we should just skip the index. So you may actually be in this situation where a worse complexity might be better for this kind of query. Or, worse, worse situation, there's a situation called, it works in my machine. So developers are always in this area, right? So they ship to production, then you go to this area over there, and you discover that all your algorithms or your assumptions were wrong because you tested everything with this here. So if ever you can have productive data to develop, do it. It's much better. You're going to foresee a lot of trouble, even with SQL because you are going to add the right indexes. So if you care about big O notation, there's a nice website that explains it all. Usually with SQL, uh, as far as algorithmic complexity is concerned, you're only looking at the algorithmic complexity, not the memory consumption complexity. That's more rare. When you're, using, uh, when you're coding stuff with Java, you have to consider both things. Very interesting things to think about, and I completely agree with Martin from the keynote today. It's very interesting to know these things. You should know these things. They're very interesting. But you shouldn't think about these things every time you write something silly like some business logic. That's my opinion. So it will distract you from the bigger logic. And these languages have been designed to forget about these things in 95% 90, of the time. Now think about histograms. This is an interesting thing. This is a histogram. We have a bank accounts transaction table. Typical e-banking system. And I'm imagining this system to look like this. In the middle, Around zero, we have all the little payments. Like when you go to a restaurant, you pay 50 francs. So that's a little payment. Or if you are the restaurant, you receive 50 francs. So in the middle, in this bell curve, we have much more transactions than on the left and the right. On the left, I bought a car. I paid, I don't know, 20,000. On the right, I have my salary. I get my 50,000 paycheck each month, right? Excellent. Now, let me ask you a question. We have these two predicates here. Predicate one and predicate two. One goes from minus 2,000 to 2,000, so the range is 4,000. Predicate two goes from 5,000 to 9,000, so 
So the range is 4,000. They are equal ranges. But are they the same predicates? Do both predicates profit from indexing? This predicate here selects almost all the data. We're in the middle of our non-uniformly distributed data. So this is not a uniform distribution, it's a bell curve. So in this case, if you let the user select this in the user interface, and the database will tell you, OK, I'm just going to scan the entire table, or at least the entire data set for this user, because the index won't help me. It will not be selective. So if you load the index first, and then you load the table, that's more work than just loading the table entirely, and then skipping about 5%. This, however, is very selective. So we're selecting maybe 3% thir of our data. So here, an index is very useful. So what I'm trying to prove here is indexing is one aspect of uh, SQL performance. Sometimes it's better to use the index, sometimes not. But you don't care about these things either. Well, you can put the index, because for some queries it's good, and for others it's not. The database knows these things. The database will figure out the right, right algorithm in production while you don't even care about this. <laughs> the database knows how many rows are returned from a table. It has these cardinalities. How many rows are returned from a subquery or from a query? It has these cardinalities. They add up. How much does it cost to access the disk? Do you want to think about these things? Now we switch from um, HDD to solid state drive. You don't even know because your product is uh, implemented, uh, is, is uh, installed by a customer and you have no operations access. You don't know th uh, anything about the, oper uh, the um, production system. The database still does, and it optimizes the algorithms depending on what kind of disk you have. And the cache, there's a cache. In every database, you have something like a buffer cache, so the database doesn't just access the table all the time. If a table is accessed frequently, it's in memory already. Do you care about this? No. The database knows these things. How often is the query run? Is it run once a year or 5,000 times a day? It's optimized differently. How often is the table accessed? I have many of these bullets. How much memory do we have? Do you care about this when you write the business logic? You can't care about these things all the time. That's so low level. That's, that's crazy. You have to be more productive. How many processes are running in parallel right now? Are we having an ETL job that keeps you from running your fast queries because you have a lot of contention? You don't know while you code this stuff. Maybe you do sometimes, but you don't know always. Is the operating system doing anything? How does the query perform with this bind variable? So we had those two parameter sets, right? The ranges were different. How does the query perform with this set, with this set? Are we running on HTTP, SSD, Flash, or RAM? Now, every NoSQL DB vendor will tell you, you don't need databases anymore. You need relational database. Put everything in memory. We've got the solution for you. OK, they solved this problem, but all the other bullets are still there, even for those databases. They still have algorithmic complexity. If you run something in logarithmic time in memory, it's still faster than in linear time in memory. It's obvious, right? <coughs> How many locks do we have on our rows? As in flat stock talk. That's extremely complicated. If you have locking, if you, I'm just talking about reading from the database. If you have locking, everything gets 100 times more complicated. I luckily work only with read-only databases. It's so much easier, so much more fun. Everything has a cost. Now, how does SQL work? Everything has a cost. A parse SQL string produces an expression tree, and this is an expression tree, right? So we have a pseudo SQL statement at the bottom, A plus A minus B, and the expression tree is this graph I, I displayed, just an um, illustration. So it is parsed into expression tree, and multiple expression trees are equivalent. They can be transformed into each other. So we can prove this with math. If you have one expression tree here, and by the laws of associativity, we can just switch the parentheses between plus and minus. They're associative, these are, um, uh, operations. And now that we have A plus A, we can switch this to 2 times A. There's also a math proof that uh, you can apply here. That's the same thing. And now imagine accessing A is super expensive. Right? A is on a remote server. Over the wire, it has lots of latencies, so obviously the right algorithm is going to be better than the left. And now someone fixes this in production. Some DBA says, oh, I find out I can actually speed up this, this database link, and it's no longer the bottleneck, and the database will switch back to the left algorithm. We didn't even notice this, right? So this is how SQL works. The best plan is the one that has the lowest estimated cost that is chosen and that is executed, and once it is executed, <coughs> the actual execution cost it's going to be measured and compared with the estimate. And if the estimate was wrong, then we choose the second best plan. All databases differ in how they actually do this. But when's the last time you wrote code like that, this in Java? 
code that profiles your application in production and then chooses among five different algorithms that you actually thought of while you coded your application. You never do this. You don't like doing this. Your estimates, whenever you estimate stuff under time pressure, you're doing estimates on your developer machine. You're not doing your estimates in production. They're two times wrong. Your assumptions are wrong, and then your productive data is wrong. And there's a special treat if you're using Oracle 12. <coughs> they can actually even switch the execution plan in flight while it's being executed. The database has now this new feature called Adaptive Execution Plans, and while it executes a query, this is mostly applicable for reports, but if your report was estimated to run 30 minutes by the database and suddenly it runs, it sees, okay, this cardinality is five times higher than I expected, it will run two hours, it will switch the plan and choose something else. So databases are getting better and better and better, and I, I'm pretty sure machine learning and these kind of things go into optimizers pretty soon as well. I'm sure this is going to be researched about. Production is here. Your estimate development environment is here. So this is the reason why you will never want to code these algorithms in large-scale enterprise systems yourself, unless there's always an exception, there's always a niche when you really, 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 really know your domain very well and you care about performance very, very much, then you do it, but usually don't. Usually fast enough is good enough, and SQL is fast. I've shown you this super fast. And now that you know all of this, what do you prefer? This or this? This was easy. The other one was hard. We could discuss endlessly about philosophies, design patterns, whatever, data types, data structures. Here you don't even have a choice, you just run this query, it's very easy. And I talk about SQL conferences because SQL is the only ever successful mainstream and general purpose fourth generation programming language. So it was always the dream of developers in the 70s, 80s, when these languages were first uh, developed, Prolog and all these languages. We don't want to think about algorithms all the time. Sometimes our logic is so logic and so complex, it's much better to use a logic language like SQL. It's functional even, it doesn't have any side effects. And it is awesome. Now, back in the days, optimizers were really sucked. It was hard. It's, it's still hard. It's very hard to write a good optimizer. But today we have this. If you, uh, if you spend the license money, you, you can use Oracle. It's wonderful. Postgres is getting better and better, and even MySQL is advancing. So do try these things out. Do try out how much time do you need to write a good algorithm that can compete with the SQL algorithm per query, right? And you, how many queries do you have? Do you have this much time to code? Or just spend a little bit more money on licensing and then ship into production much more easily, faster and better? So why doesn't anyone else talk about SQL? I don't know. All these fancy uh, technologies, even JavaScript, it, coders want to code. They want to do everything themselves. But are you sure about that? Do you really want to do that? Do you really want to discuss hash maps all the time? Can I write SQL in Java? A little bit of advertising. Of course you can. We have a product that does uh, SQL in Java in a type safe way. So I assume uh, I have been here so many times in different uh, venues. How many people use Juke already? So quite a few people. All right, so you should try this out. This is a type safe SQL in Java. So that every uh, table and uh, column is uh, an object with type information associated with it. Everything is type checked by the uh, Java compiler. And you can have this level of productiveness as if you were writing a store procedure in Java directly. So people are referred to Juke like this as well. Or uh, I've seen people do this or that. OK. So what's the key takeaway of this talk? Can you do it in the database? Yes, you can. I've already proven this in the last talk. SQL is Turing complete. We've seen this Mandelbrot set. You can do everything in principle with SQL. And when I say in the database, I don't mean store procedures. I mean SQL. SQL is the awesome thing. Store procedures are kind of weird. We all agree on this. Sometimes it's the better choice, but SQL is really the powerful thing inside of your database. Can you do it in the database? Today, it was so simple. Everyone can do this, right? So you can write these simple joins very easily. It's going to be super fast. And if you think you can't do it in the database and you need some more training, I do offer that. So please get in touch. There's a two-day SQL training, uh, SQL functionality. This is the first talk, and this was the second talk about performance. We go more into details than uh, I did today. Can you do it in your database? Yes, all of the databases are super fast today. The modern databases are super fast, unless you're using MySQL. For instance, MySQL still doesn't have hash joins, uh, as far as I'm informed. I'm not sure if MySQL 8 finally implements them, but Without hash joins, you have a whole set of algorithms that are not available to you. So sometimes the database is not there yet, but very often it is. Should you do it in the database? 
business logic in a database, right? So this is the hot topic of everyone, every discussion around coffee. You shouldn't do business logic in a database, right? No, I'm just kidding. Of course you should do business logic in a database, especially when you're using a logic language. It's the best language for business logic. I hope I convinced you today. Do long talk titles attract attention. We've seen this title, so you're all here, not listening to the Java 9 talk. Wonderful, this works as well. And will this talk ever end? Also, yes. There is the 10 SQL tricks talk. If you want to see that as well, Google it and you'll find a transcript and the video of it. So you see even more SQL awesomeness. These are my coordinates. Thank you very much. <laughs> Time is over. Okay. No questions. And uh, don't forget to vote on your way out. Yeah, remember that slide in the beginning? Thank you very much. <laughs>